Okay, welcome everybody to this year, uh, sorry, the, today's, uh, this week's installment of our uh, CDAC webinar series uh, from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, today, we're really pleased to have Professor Peter Hausowski give the webinar talk today. Peter is an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. He also holds an appointment in the Physical and Computational Sciences Directorate at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington. Peter received his undergraduate degrees in chemistry, mathematics, and chemical engineering from Kansas State University, and his PhD degree from the University of California, Berkeley, where he worked with Professor Paidong Yang. He followed that with an E.O. Lawrence postdoctoral fellowship at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and from there moved to his current position at UW. Peter's research interests are in the design, synthesis, and characterization of optoelectronic point defects within novel nanoscale optoelectronic ceramic materials, including nanodiamonds and inorganic nanocrystals doped with rare earth ions. His research efforts are focused on understanding and manipulating the physical and chemical properties of point defects within nanoscale optoelectronic materials with the aim of engineering their atomistic microstructure to meet performance metrics defined by specific applications for information technology, energy conversion and storage, and the biomedical sectors. Professor Pazowski has won a number of prestigious awards, including the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award and an NSF, and an NSF Career Award. He has been a guest professor at the Institute for Quantum Optics in Ulm, Germany, and most recently was awarded the Graduate Faculty of the Year Award in the Material Science and Engineering Department at UW. Today, Professor Pawlowski is going to tell us about his work in synthesis and laser cooling of point defects at gigapascal pressures. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Steve, for the very kind introduction. And uh, also, thank you very much to the organizers of the uh, CDAC seminar series, where in the COVID era, it's really wonderful to get to uh, hear about uh, exciting scientific developments from all over the world. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the opportunity to share some of our recent uh, efforts in, in high pressure science with the community today. And uh, as Steve mentioned, I'm, I'm going to focus predominantly on a talk on the synthesis of point defects at extreme uh, GPA pressures. And also uh, towards the end of my talk, I want to share some recent results that we've been working towards to not just make point defects, but laser cool point defects at GPA pressures. Before I jump into the, the, the research side of things, I want to share this image. This is a scanning transmission electron microscope uh, uh, micrograph of nanodiamonds. You can kind of see these faint sort of uh, cloud-like uh, contours and little dots that are uh, distributed across the, the nanodiamond uh, material. Each of these little white dots is a silicon atom. And you can see uh, little, little point defects. These are actually decorating the surface of the nanodiamonds. These are adsorbed. We think they might be vacuum pump oil, uh, silicon atoms from say a, a, a silicon based uh, vacuum pump oil that's adsorbed to the surface of the diamonds. If I had a movie, th these would be uh, uh, walk, walking across the surface, but uh, it's really amazing what's possible these days in electron microscopy, just to see these images. And I think for, for uh, all of the chemists and you know uh, physicists, material scientists in the audience, it, it's never uh, never gets old to see atoms. So what I'd like to do uh, before I jump into the, the research as well is give a quick shout out to all of my group members who have been working extremely hard to make these uh, results possible. Uh, uh, in particular, Abby Gannis, uh, Chaman Gupta, uh, Matt Crane, and also Elena Dobretsova. Uh, th these are uh, four really key uh, uh, team members who have who've worked extremely hard to make the research I'll, I'll share today possible. I also wanted to thank our funding agencies. Most of the work that I'll present today has been supported by the National Science Foundation through a career award, and more recently, a, a MERSEC center that I'll, I'll mention briefly towards the uh, latter parts of the talk. But also I wanted to mention, if, if you know of anybody uh, uh, interested in working in high pressure research for uh, 
potential graduate uh, student position or, or a postdoc position, please don't hesitate to, to send them uh, an email and, and, and point them my way. I'd love to talk about, we have, we have openings in my group. And if you like the research you see here and, and are also like uh, uh, cherry blossoms in, in, in Seattle, we've got great coffee too. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and let me know if you're interested in potential uh, grad student or postdoc positions at UW. Also, speaking of Seattle, I wanted to, to share, uh, uh, this may not have been announced uh, broadly, uh, but, but the spring MRS meeting is coming to Seattle in 2024. So I hope, uh, if possible, uh, some of you might be able to join the MRS meeting in, in Seattle this coming uh, uh, spring 2024. The cherry blossoms might be out. Uh, we've got a, a new light rail train that you can take from SeaTac to the university. You can stop in downtown and see the Space Needle, uh, catch some views of Mount Rainier. And uh, I hope to, to see uh, uh, several of you in, in person one of these days once the COVID uh, era is behind us. So to give a, a quick overview of the talk I'll deliver today, uh, I'd like to begin with a quick introduction to motivation for what, why should you care about point defects in, in nano diamonds or ceramics? What's, what's the big deal? What are they good for? Uh, what, what, why do we want to make them with uh, well-defined conditions? And then I'll move on to how we've been making uh, point defects more recently uh, th through the NSF Career Project and, and uh, MERSEC Project, mostly using a laser heated diamond anvil cell to synthesize uh, point defects at extreme conditions. I'll talk a, a little bit through, through my talk about recent collaborations with a colleague in the chemistry department at UW, Professor uh, Zha Song Li, doing ab, ab initio quantum cluster uh, simulations of the, the pressure dependent properties of the point defect defects that we're making. And then finally, I'll fi finish today with some current and future directions about making point defects, but also laser cooling lanthanide based point defects in fluoride ceramics at GPA pressures. So also, uh, I think it's always uh, uh, nice to have, a, have uh, questions during the talk. So please don't hesitate. Uh, if, if you have any questions, just uh, shout them out. Or if you want to raise your hand, maybe uh, Steve, if, if you can keep an eye on the, the hands being raised, uh, let me know if anybody has a question. I'm happy to take them. If you want to type them in the box, that's great. It's always nice to have questions in real time or at the end of the talk. So to begin, I'd like to give a quick overview and introduction slash motivation for why we're making point defects. And when I first started learning about diamond anvil cells during my postdoc at Livermore, the real state of the art for diamond synthesis involved high pressure detonations and explosions with energetic materials like TNT or RDX. And you can detonate these uh, high explosives, create a very high temperature and high pressure shock wave that can convert this, this organic uh, high explosive material into diamond. And it's a really remarkable story about how these were discovered uh, back in, I think the sixties in, uh, in, uh, in Russia. And these are, you can grow huge, you can make, you can mass produce huge amounts of this material through uh, detonations, kilogram scale uh, preparations. But one challenge is you get a lot of twinning planes. You get a lot of uh, metal atoms and, and soot that that's a part of this process that I'll talk about a little bit more momentarily. So we wanted to explore new methods to make diamond materials with much more chemical precision without the sort of very rapid brief uh, detonation based explosion. And during my postdoc at Livermore, we accidentally uh, happened upon some uh, uh, doping of nanodiamond with nitrogen and silicon atoms using a solid neon uh, pressure medium. And we were really excited that we could, we could make uh, nanodiamonds, and, but we, we really weren't sure how these point defects were forming. Why did we get silicon? Why did we have nitrogen in, in the diamonds that we were making? And so more recently at the University of Washington, my group's been trying to develop methods where we can use well-defined molecules, well-defined uh, 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 molecular precursors to control not only the composition, but ideally the location of the point defects within the diamonds for a wide range of applications. And this is really sort of the direction uh, we're headed. And there are a lot of motivations for this. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen you know, the, the, in the literature, fascinating papers using the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center for quantum sensing. This is some uh, relatively recent work that, that's been used to do proton H1 NMR type measurements optically using the negatively charged NV center with nanometer cubed volume. So it's sort of like doing uh, an MRI or, or a NMR, uh, pr proton spin resonance sensing, but instead of having a, a macroscopically large volume, you can probe it, I, in principle single molecules, which is really uh, an exciting potential uh, future direction. 
also point defects have been used uh, uh, frequently in, in biological labeling. These are nanodiamonds with the negatively charged NV center that have been used to label living cells. And nanodiamonds are great because they don't photo bleach, they don't blink, they're, they're very uh, stable. And uh, Olga Shendorova's group uh, has done wonderful work to, to make these materials and demonstrate a, a, a lot of uh, exciting applications. Also, uh, point defects in diamond have been, have been used for photocatalysis. This is a really nice paper from the Hammers Group in uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, effectively showing the reduction of N2 molecules to ammonia near standard conditions. The, the, the promise is that you could potentially bypass the Haber-Bosch process that consumes 2% of global energy uh, uh, supplies just to make ammonia for fertilizers. And these point defects could potentially be used to generate photoelectrons that could fix N2 to ammonia without having to go through the extreme temperature and, and, and pressure conditions used in the Haber-Bosch process. And also in terms of basic science, basic research, there's some really beautiful papers using uh, 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 nanosims to look at uh, the secondary ion mass spec, to look at the carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio in astrophysical diamond materials, nanodiamonds. And you, you, could, you could fingerprint the origin of nanodiamonds following mede meteoric impacts in space, uh, effectively using this uh, carbon 13 to carbon 14 or or carbon 12 to carbon 13 or nitrogen 14 to nitrogen 15 ratio. So the, by understanding the distribution of point defects, not just compositional, but isotopic, you can learn a lot about the, the history and, and origin of uh, materials in the solar system. But uh, as I alluded to, the, the, uh, the current state of the art is uh, uh, detonation synthesis. And this is a really uh, extreme process uh, following detonation. These, these impurities are very difficult to get rid of. And there's some very clever ways to, to detect them. Uh, neutron activation analysis, there's some really nice work from Olga Shindarova and colleagues uh, uh, do, using neutron activation analysis to look at the distribution of heavy metals in nanodiamonds. And you can see there, there are parts per million level of, up to uh, 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 parts per thousand level uh, uh, impurities in detonation nanodiamond materials. This is what they look like after the detonation. Air oxidation can be used to get rid of some of the soot and uh, a, a good, you can oxidize a lot of the metals, but it requires a lot of processing to, to purify the detonation material for these very sensitive quantum uh, type uh, applications. There's also been a lot of work recently in plasma growth of diamonds. So there's some really nice papers showing the uh, uh, growth of diamond using a, a hydrogen or ammonia, or I'm sorry, methane-based plasma. But one challenge in plasma growth is you often get hydrogen point defects in, in diamond. And this can quench the optical luminescence of the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center. So we're, we're looking for methods that we can avoid metallic impurities and also avoid hydrogen. Um, th there's some recent reports of using uh, atmospheric pressure plasmas to grow nanodiamonds in uh, Nature Communications. Our group has tried to reproduce these uh, papers and has, has not yet, uh, we've not succeeded so far, but there's some really uh, uh, nice ideas for how you could potentially nucleate and grow diamonds in, uh, in, in near atmospheric pressure conditions. I also wanted to uh, uh, discuss briefly some very nice work using multi-anvil press apparatus uh, uh, experiments to grow relatively large amounts of diamond material using well-defined temperatures and pressures. One challenge of the multi-anvil press is that it's hard to get optical access to the multi-anvil uh, cell chambers. It's, it's hard to do, for instance, Raman spectroscopy in situ in, in these multi-anvil press instruments. It's also difficult uh, frequently to use inert pressure media like noble gases in multi-anvil presses. Um, but, but there's been some very nice work recently uh, sh sh uh, demonstrating the synthesis and also doping of nanodiamonds using a multi-anvil press uh, approach. And this is very complementary, I would say, to the laser heated diamond anvil cell. And, and this is really what my group has been using predominantly at the University of Washington. I, I first started learning about this as a postdoc at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And the idea, in case you've you've not uh, uh, worked with a laser heated DAC before, is effectively just to have a, a focused uh, high power near infrared laser focusing into the center of the uh, uh, chamber. We have two uh, uh, diamond anvils counterposed, and we, we can load the diamond anvil cell with neon, with argon. Argon is sort of our standard working horse uh, uh, quasi hydrostatic pressure medium. We, we add a, a ruby crystal. Uh, we, we use ruby luminescence as our primary pressure sensor, and we 
we started this direction. This, this is a, a picture of our Bowler Almac stack, kind of a workhorse stack in our, our group. I, I have this slide mostly when, when I give talks to, to non-high pressure audiences to uh, uh, illustrate sort of the, the link scales and size scales and, and what's possible. These are also a silicon nanowires that we've been able to load onto the Diamond Anvil uh, uh, Qlet. And back in 2016, we published a paper uh, I wanted to share, uh, uh, which was really intriguing and interesting. I, I was excited about this result that we could start with a cubic silicon uh, 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 sample nanowire, compress the uh, silicon one phase at, at high pressure and, and track, trace this with Raman spectroscopy to silicon two, which is tetragonal. And then on releasing pressure, we could recover silicon four, which is a hexagonal uh, Brave lattice. What's really interesting about the hexagonal Brave lattice is it has a direct band gap. And we, we could make effectively hexagonal silicon nanowires keeping the same morphology, the sort of one dimensional linear morphology of silicon. This is a really interesting material because the, the direct band gap opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of light harvesting. You could imagine applications in uh, solar cells. So uh, the, the direct band gap leads to a number of exciting potential uh, applications. But with this sort of uh, stage, I, I'd like to segue next into focusing on how we're making diamonds and deliberately doping point defects in the, in the diamond lattice. So how do we do this in the lab? And typically, uh, our, our starting material in this, uh, this uh, deliberate synthetic doping approach, in contrast to, say, RDX, you know, detonation explosions or plasma processing, is we start with very well-defined or organic or organometallic molecular precursors. And this is a resorcinol formaldehyde uh, uh, mixture that's typically uh, a, a polymerization reaction, either acid catalyzed or base catalyzed. What we typically, we can work in uh, water for base catalyzed reactions. We typically work in acetonitrile for acid catalyzed reactions, but this is just a, 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 a cross coupling reaction, a condensation reaction, where effectively we're, we're making carbon carbon bonds, uh, uh, oxygen carbon bonds. And what we get is a gel. This is a really high surface area organic aerogel, hydrocarbon aerogel. This process was first developed back in the 1980s by uh, scientists in the chemical sciences uh, division at the Livermore lab. And, and these materials were originally developed for supercapacitors to, to power the, the National Ignition Facilities pulsed nanosecond uh, lasers, which, which are doing some very beautiful work in uh, uh, planetary uh, science these days, and also in terms of stockpile stewardship. But uh, effectively, th this organic aerogel is, is the sort of very chemically pure starting material that we make. And then we supercritically dry the, the gel. We effectively use uh, uh, supercritical car carbon dioxide to remove all of the, the, the water from the, the gel phase uh, and, and effectively recover a hydrocarbon aerogel that we can then heat up. It's just a high temperature pyrolysis, maybe a thousand degrees Celsius. And I like to say we drive off all the hydro. You can think of the H2O in formaldehyde. We try to get, remove all of the hydrogen and oxygen from the uh, hydrocarbon precursor molecules we start with. And after pyrolysis, we're left with a very high surface, surface area, amorphous carbon aerogel. And so these are really uh, fascinating materials that have sort of mass fractal microstructure that you can think of these sort of like a pearl necklace, like black pearls instead of uh, 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 white pearls. And, and these are connected in three-dimensional space. And the goal in our, our research is to dope this hydrocarbon material with molecular uh, uh, precursors that have well-defined heteroatoms. And then we can undergo a, a, a high pressure, high temperature phase transition from amorphous carbon to diamond in a laser heated diamond anvil cell. So that kind of uh, gives a quick overview of, of the experiment. We, we make the aerogel. Typically we'll load the uh, in, interior pores of the aerogel with either neon or argon, a face centered cubic uh, neon or argon at high pressure serves as a very nice quasi hydrostatic pressure medium. And then we use laser heating to drive a phase transition from amorphous carbon to diamond while preserving the sort of mass fractal microstructure of the, the target materials. So uh, next, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a few more details of the synthesis. We're typically using a, a 50 watt plus uh, near infrared neodymium YAG laser, just CW. Uh, pulse lasers would also be great to use in this uh, experiment. We also have a, a Raman laser focused into the diamond anvil cell. This is a setup built by uh, Jonathan Crowhurst and Joe Zog, uh, and also Mike Armstrong at the Livermore lab. This, this is an image from, from when I was working with them as a postdoc that sort of tells the story of, of what we've built at UW as well uh, very nicely. 
And one unique property of aerogel that, that I wanted to share is that it has a near unit absorption coefficient. So th this is a plot of the directional hemispherical reflectance of aerogel. And you can see uh, for, for carbon aerogel in this sort of uh, near infrared uh, spectral range, the, the uh, directional hemispherical reflectance is on the order of 1%. So 99 out of 100 photons effectively get absorbed by this material. And for a 50 watt laser, you can reach extreme temperatures very quickly on, on the order of you know 2000 degrees kelvin very easily to reach the temperatures required to form diamond. So this is a schematic uh, we had put together to sort of illustrate this process. We've got a rhenium gasket, the ruby crystal. We load with amorphous carbon aerogel, fill the interior with the noble gas. We, we, we have the chamber sealed at about uh, 4.8 GPA neon freezes, about 1.8 GPA uh, argon freezes to a face centered cubic lattice, where we can then laser heat the carbon to, to high uh, temperatures to, to drive the phase transition to diamond. And we can follow up with additional lasers to do Raman spectroscopy, photoluminescence, uh, et cetera. So this is a quick uh, optical micrograph of what the aerogel looks like before heating. It's basically as, as black as night uh, 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 on a cloudy night in Seattle. Um, but, but after a uh, series of laser heating, this is another dark field optical micrograph. We can sort of scan the laser around the sample and you can start to see the sort of translucent scattering that, that uh, ultimately is from the formation of a high index diamond phase within the uh, 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 amorphous carbon matrix that we can start to see the, the sort of visual evidence of the phase uh, con conversion. We can also take these materials uh, to an electron microscope. This is a carbon air gel that we've pressurized but not laser heated as a control. We do electron diffraction on this uh, material and you can see a lack of uh, uh, crystalline diffraction. Basically, we just have amorphous uh, scattering. But if you laser heat the carbon air gel, you, you can image the microstructure. You can still see it's, it's very porous. But under electron diffraction, you can start to see these very bright uh, diffraction rings that index to cubic crystalline diamond. So this is additional evidence we have that we've we've undergone a phase transition, not just the visual, uh, you know, light scattering evidence, but but the electron diffraction. We can also recover these materials and take them to an X-ray absorption beamline. These were experiments done at the ALS uh, beamline 532 in uh, Berkeley. This, this is, uh, a, 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 I'll spare you the overview of, of, of uh, how a synchrotron works, but basically we have a, a Fresnel zone plate where we can focus a uh, monochromated X-ray beam onto a sample with a spot size on the order of 20 nanometers. I think that the spot size is now approaching 10 nanometers at uh, beamline 532. And we, we can scan over the sample and collect X-ray absorption spectra. This is a spectrum of the nanocrystalline diamond aerogel. This is a spectrum of the amorphous carbon uh, starting material that, that we've uh, started with. And you can see really quickly a, a dip in the carbon 1s to pi star uh, graphitic absorption peak going from amorphous carbon to, to nanocrystalline diamond. You can also start to see this dip in the, the uh, uh, X-ray absorption spectrum at about 302 electron volts. And this, this uh, uh, maps on to this, the so-called second gap in diamond's electronic density of states. And so this is uh, compelling evidence that we, we have uh, a microstructural uh, you know, uh, change in, in the phase of the carbon from amorphous to uh, a, diamond, uh, uh, a diamond phase. This pre-edge feature is something that I'd like to return to later on in the talk. We, we think that there's most likely a graphitic surface reconstruction around the surface of the diamonds. This is just some electron diffraction after X-ray absorption to show that we didn't uh, uh, completely obliterate the uh, bonding and diamond crystal lattice during the X-ray absorption experiment. But uh, th that pre-edge feature at, at uh, uh, 284 electron volts, we think what, what's going on is a, a surface reconstruction. If you use neon, for instance, or argon, they're very noble gases. They don't form covalent bonds readily with, with uh, any other elements in the periodic table normally. And so we think what's happening in terms of this pre-edge X-ray absorption feature is the carbon atoms on the surface of the diamond grains have nothing else to bond with, and they're, they're effectively bonding with each other to make graphite or a sort of a, a, a reconstructed graphitic-like phase at the surface of the diamonds. This is a, a paper from a few years ago in collaboration with Song Lee's group in the chemistry department, where we did some ab initio quantum cluster simulations to sort of observe these sp2 type bonds forming on the surface of the diamond uh, 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 in vacuum, at least. We, we can also, using electron microscopy, zoom into these uh, diamonds. You can, you can take high resolution TM images, and these are the 111 lattice fringes of the cubic uh, diamond crystal lattice. You can see these 111 fringes. 
And we, we wanted to characterize these diamonds further with, say, Raman uh, uh, spectroscopy. So we started to collect Raman spectra, but all of a sudden we started to see very bright luminescence from, from these diamonds that we were really concerned about. We, we thought maybe we couldn't get, you know, diamond Raman, that the, the photoluminescence was just too bright. And after looking into the literature, we were really excited and surprised to see that these well-defined peaks, this is about three, six, 640 uh, nanometers. This is a peak at about 740 nanometers. Both of these peaks correlate very closely to the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center at, at about 640 or 638 uh, nanometers, and also the negatively charged silicon split vacancy center at about 740 uh, nanometers. And these have been well known for decades, thanks to research by uh, uh, De Beers and, and, and others to try to understand point defects in diamond. But both of these defects have also been uh, proposed for very exciting applications in quantum information science, quantum sensing, quantum communication, and even uh, quantum computation. So once we had uh, figured out a way to at least make well-defined nanodiamonds, the, the next stage in our research was to try to control, instead of just accidentally making, say, the, the NV minus center versus the, the negatively charged silicon split vacancy, Center, we wanted to use precise molecular methods to call our shot and make these defects on, on demand. So for focusing first on the silicon uh, split vacancy center, we had a hypothesis that when we were making our carbon aerogel material, we we're actually using a glass beaker and base catalyzed uh, 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 cross-linking reactions in water. And uh, if, if you've worked in a chemistry lab before, often a, a base bath is used to etch silica, silica uh, glass glassware used in uh, synthetic reactions. And so, so we started to wonder, you know, maybe at these, even at these very mild pH conditions of 8.4 and modest temperatures, you know, around 40 degrees Celsius, maybe we were etching the silica off the glass. So we did a control experiment with a, a, a glass-free reaction vessel. This is just a, a, a plastic uh, falcon tube. And uh, we, we could still use the base catalyzed reaction or acid catalyzed reaction, but it, when we switched to a plastic uh, re reaction vessel, we no longer were, we hypothesized we would no longer make silicic acid during the cross-linking reaction. And, and sure enough, that's what happened. We, we had a, uh, a, a base catalyzed reaction that uh, was forming silicon, the, the, the uh, negatively charged silicon split vacancy center in diamond. And by simply switching to a, a plastic tube, we were able to completely eliminate that silicon split vacancy emission from the sample. And so we published this a few years ago in Diamond and Related Materials just showing that you can get rid of the silicon and uh, eliminate it from forming, which is the first stage in controlling what you're trying to make is, is make sure it doesn't happen uh, accidentally. So we started to do some uh, electron microscopy of our, our uh, starting materials and recovered materials, you know, our, our control samples that supposedly had no silicon. We were collaborating with Rhonda Stroud at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, DC. And Rhonda has an amazing uh, scanning transmission electron microscope from the NEON uh, 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 company where Rhonda can zoom in and effectively collect X-ray fluorescent spectra from individual atoms in a variety of uh, nanoscale materials. So we sent our starting materials to Rhonda and said, Rhonda, we want to know what's what's in this uh, uh, material at a, at a microstructural level. There shouldn't be any silicon there. And Rhonda uh, did some quick measurements with her group and uh, sent us some images back and said, I, I've got bad news. Uh, you actually have silicon on, on the material that you said should be silicon free. And we're scratching our heads wondering, you know, what's causing this? Why why should we have silicon? And most likely it's vacuum pump oil, we think, uh, in, in the lab. If you have high surface area materials, it's, it's like a sponge. And any modest vapor pressure of, say, uh, silica grease in, in, a, in, a, in a schlink line from a vacuum tube could deposit on the aerogels. And effectively, the, the aerogels will trap these materials. So these are diamonds that we made without any silicon. And there's, there's no silicon split vacancy emission. But we can actually see silicon atoms from the, the pump oil sort of absorbing onto the surface. So, uh, you know, with that knowledge, we, we, were, uh, we were confident that at least surface coating of the carbon materials, silicon is everywhere in a lab uh, at, at, you know, PPT levels, it, it, you know, from, from vacuum pump oil or PDMS, there are a lot of laboratory sources. So next we started to design experiments where we, we tried to recover that silicon split vacancy 
potency emission by deliberate molecular doping. So this is a very well-known organic molecular precursor. This is tetraethyl orthosilicate that's used to make silica aerogels often in a laboratory uh, uh, scenario. So we simply added you know, PPB to PPM levels of this uh, 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 or organic uh, molecular precursor for silicon into the resorcinol formaldehyde reaction vessel. This is also in the plastic uh, reaction vessel to avoid any etching of silica. And then we, we dope the carbon aerogel with these silicon atoms at a range of different concentrations. We could actually see silicon atoms uh, from X-ray fluorescence in a transmission electron microscope of our starting materials. Then we went through the high pressure, high temperature laser heating process and then went to our uh, spectrometer. And sure enough, we could see a range of different emission uh, intensities depending on the doping level. If, if we dope at parts per uh, billion or parts per trillion levels, we can see just a, 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 minute, a minute amount of emission. And if we really dope the heck out of these things with say parts per million plus uh, uh, levels of silicon, uh, effectively we could start making silicon carbide or, or other uh, 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 allotropes or po polytypes of silicon carbide with this uh, approach. But you can see this very uh, pronounced silicon, uh, neg the negatively charged silicon vacancy emission from these dope materials. So really excited to, to be able to control that. And these these results were recently published in Science Advances a couple of years ago. If you'd like to learn more about the experimental methods and, and details, but I also wanted to share really. Uh, unanticipated surprise we had during these experiments. And we knew silicon should be in these samples, but when we sent we sent these new materials back to Rhonda's lab at, at the Naval Research Lab, Rhonda wrote us back and said, uh, have you guys ever seen argon in your diamond materials before? Because it's there. And we, we were shocked that uh, in this process, not only have we loaded silicon atoms into the diamond material, but also somehow we had formed argon point defects in, in the sample. And we could see, uh, Rhonda could see these uh, argon atoms also from X-ray uh, 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 luminescence measurements from, from EDAX uh, in her microscope. We could see this at, at the University of Washington as well in our, our less uh, uh, resolved, less uh, um, spatially resolved uh, microscope. Rhonda also was able to see argon from the L2, L3 edge using electron energy loss spectroscopy. So we, we knew uh, argon atoms had made it into the diamonds, but we were really surprised by this. This had never really been reported before that, that we were aware of in, in high pressure, high temperature conditions. We, we thought argon should be chemically inert and it shouldn't dope the diamonds, but there it was uh, in, in our new diamond materials. We started to scratch our heads and wonder, you know, what, what could be going on in this uh, process? And here's some recent data, some recent experiments prepared by Chaman Gupta in my group. This is a carbon aerogel target. This is solid argon. I apologize, I forget the pressure, the exact pressure in this experiment. I think it's around 12 uh, gigapascals. And you can see as we laser heat the carbon aerogel target material, you can see these sort of waves of uh, uh, Part particle motion, and eventually you can you can start to see uh, effectively fluidization fronts as the argon fluidizes. It, it's not a liquid per se; it's it's a superfluid. But you can see these sort of rings of uh, superfluid argon propagating. And we started to wonder, maybe as we were uh, laser heating, that this is at, at longer time points, you can see how the, the carbon material can decompose. It, it can uh, it can propagate throughout the the culet at, at extreme conditions. We started to hypothesize maybe the superfluid argon was the atoms of argon were able to dissolve or diffuse within the micropores of the aerogel and effectively get trapped in the lattice uh, after uh, they were uh, fluidized. So uh, we started to really scratch our heads and wonder, like, is this possible? Is this realistic? And, and we started to look more at what the temperatures were during the experiment. We could easily melt argon. It was clear we could melt argon. But um, typically to extract the temperature, we're using the Planck emission from the laser heated uh, focal volume. This is uh, an image of a laser heated carbon aerogel target sample. If you really crank up the laser power, you can illuminate the entire room from a spot size that's just 100, 100 microns across. We collect this sort of uh, uh, visible luminescence, this Planck luminescence, black body radiation from the laser heated sample. And we fit this with nonlinear least squares fitting to approximate the temperature on the order of uh, 1800 or 1900 Kelvin. And there, there are certain moments where we see these very bright flashes. They're difficult for us to capture in time. They're sort of spontaneous. And we see these little pops of, of, of white hot emission. And if we fit these as, as a function of, as we increase the laser power and just sort of collect these Planck spectra uh, progressively, we see these really sharp uh, and, and rapid bursts of temperature for very brief moments of time. 
that, that the temperatures can reach on the order of 2000 Kelvin. So we started to hypothesize, maybe we're melting the face centered cubic uh, argon uh, pressure medium, and the superfluid can diffuse, the atoms can diffuse into the diamonds and get trapped in there uh, in real uh, real time. So this is another uh, you know cartoon of the, the amorphous carbon aerogel. We sort of model these as nanospheres. And we can start to do analytical calculations of what temperatures should these reach at, at, at given uh, laser power. So there are a lot of details in the modeling. I don't have a lot of time today to, to share all of the, the uh, computational modeling, but effectively we're solving the uh, heat transfer equation in three dimensional uh, using a three dimensional Laplacian using a classical product solution, we can start to compute what temperatures this this material should make. And uh, one very interesting physical property change is that when, when you go from solid argon, face centered cubic argon at, at around 20 gigapascals to su superfluid argon uh, at 20 gigapascals, so the thermal conductivity drops by at least one order of magnitude. So we're hypothesizing that effectively we're, we're, we're fluidizing the argon into a supercritical fluid. It, these atoms rapidly diffuse into the carbon target material. And then once the diamond lattice forms at these extreme conditions, it's trapping those atoms inside the diamond crystal. And then we can recover those samples. We can take them on to, to an electron microscope under high vacuum conditions. And the argon atoms are trapped uh, as point defects in these uh, materials. We, we can also compare the analytical calculations that we've made by solving this three-dimensional Laplacian and, and using uh, uh, an infinite series, you know, multi-infinite series approach to calculate these temperatures, and, and sure enough, if you if you drop the thermal conductivity by an order of magnitude, we can easily reach 2,000 Kelvin in this sort of gaseous or superfluid argon phase. I, it's always awkward to talk about the. It's not melting. It's not a solid to liquid phase transition. It's a solid to superfluid phase transition with no surface tension. So so these atoms are, are really able to move. There's really uh, a, a very low surface energy between the, the, the superfluid phase and the solid uh, material. But so, so not only could we make, uh, you know, argon atoms and also silicon split vacancy atoms, but we could also model the properties of these point defects using ab initio quantum cluster calculations. And going back to our, our very uh, productive and, and uh, exciting collaboration with Zha Song Li's group in the chemistry department, we, we ran some ab initio quantum cluster calculations of the negatively charged silicon split vacancy center. We could calculate what the homo lumo tra transitions are for this defect. There's some really fascinating Jan Teller distortions of the defect. Uh, that, that have been proposed to, to explain its low temperature uh, optical properties. And what ja, we, we mentioned to Zha Song that we, did made, we had made these silicon split vacancy point defects, and we asked them if they could calculate the pressure dependence of the homo lumo transition of these defects for us to compare with experiments. And so we had made uh, uh, experimental measurements of the pressure dependent uh, shift of the zero phonon line luminescence from this defect. And we, we did a double blind experiment where we told them we had the data, but we didn't tell them what the slope was. We really wanted to kick the tires on their DFT code to, to see if, if it worked. And uh, our experimental results showed a, a pressure dependent shift of about one millivolt per GPA for the negatively charged silicon split vacancy center. And their theoretical calculations were very close to this. Uh, we, we were really, they were using a parameterized uh, lattice constant from bulk uh, diamond to, to uh, compute the, 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 the shift in the lattice constant as a function of pressure, then feeding that into their DFT model. And they predicted a pressure dependent shift of the silicon vacancy uh, zero phonon line of about 0 0.8 MeV per GPA. So given that we had argon atoms in the diamond and, and uh, uh, nano crystal and diamond phases with unknown surface reconstructions and you know, complex uh, surfaces, we were really pleased to see this agreement between the, their theory and the experiment. And uh, more of these details are also uh, included in, in, in our paper from a couple of years ago. But I really wanted to uh, send a shout out to Alessio Petroni, Ryan Beck, and Zha Song Lee for uh, really, really doing a great job with these calculations. So my last few minutes today, I don't want to go too much over uh, 50 minutes. I, I wanted to share a little bit more about our current and future directions to make point defects, but also laser cool point defects at GPA pressures. So um, more recently, uh, one, one of my group members, Abby Gannis, is in the process of uh, uh, submitting a paper where instead of doping with silicon, Abby's led efforts to dope with nitrogen in diamond uh, uh, nano diamond materials. And Abby chose a molecule, this is hexamethylene tetramine or hexamine, which is very nitrogen rich. So rather than calling our shot with the silicon split vacancy center, Abby wanted to demonstrate molecular control over nitrogen point defects in 
in diamond. So it's a very similar process. We, we try to avoid silicon at all costs by using this sort of plastic uh, reaction vessel. It's a, it's a batch uh, reactor. We, we add a range of different concentrations. A Abby will add a range of different concentrations of hexamine to the uh, organo organic starting materials and go through the same process, pyrolysis, and was asking a question, can we increase emission from nitrogen uh, uh, vacancy defects in diamond? So a Abby's done a really wonderful job in, in this project. This is a, a TM image that Abby also got with Rhonda Stroud at the Naval Research Lab in, in Washington, DC. Abby won a prestigious uh, Goldstein Travel Fellowship to uh, work with Rhonda and, and uh, collect these these uh, very nice TM images. You can see faceting one-on-one -on -one facets of the diamonds. Uh, you can see sort of a quasi-amorphous or graphitic type uh, reconstruction, surface reconstruction. We're currently analyzing these high-res TM images using Fourier transforms to map out the phase distribution potential. Graf we, we also see graphitic domains in the recovered material. Abby's, Abby's also collected some electron diffraction uh, images where we can see some hint of a graphitic, uh, some lingering graphitic phase in this material. But uh, also intriguingly, we might also have some preliminary evidence of twinning planes from these uh, recovered materials. But uh, you, you can see a in terms of the carbon K edge X-ray absorption feature, there's very little graphitic uh, material on the on the sample. Abby ha has also observed argon atoms also doping these uh, diamonds, but very excitingly, Abby, th these little green dots in the image, if, if you can see this, uh, if it shows up okay through Zoom, uh, these little green dots are nitrogen X-ray photons that, that get em emitted in Rhonda's microscope when the, the electron comes in, kicks out a 1S electron from the nitrogen and, and uh, uh, X-ray fluorescence is, is uh, can be used to map out the nitrogen distribution in these materials. And Abby has shown a five-fold increase in nitrogen, in nitrogen-doped materials versus nitrogen, uh, non-nitrogen-doped materials. Abby also has some really nice recent data on the pressure-dependent shift of the, 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 Abby's been able to observe the negatively charged uh, uh, nitrogen vacancy center forming in these diamonds. And at high pressures, Abby's been able to make pressure dependent zero phonon line uh, measurements of these materials. And they correlate really nicely with, with uh, previous uh, reports of the, the pressure dependent shift. It's about 5.75 millivolts per GPA uh, of a pressure dependent shift, which, which Abby is also seeing in these uh, diamonds she's made. And what we're currently trying, to, one question we're currently trying to answer is whether we might be forming more complex defects. If you have this sort of tetrahedral configuration of nitrogen atoms in your starting molecule, we, we want to answer the question, can, can we observe the formation of the so-called B center, which is an array of four nitrogen atoms surrounding a, a vacancy in the, in the cubic crystalline diamond lattice? Does the stereochemistry of the molecule that we're using to, to make these defects translate into the actual diamond crystals that we're making after our high pressure uh, laser, laser heating experiment? Also, I wanted to share some really exciting recent data that another group member of mine, Chaman Gupta, has made recently. Chaman, instead of uh, worrying about argon doping in our diamonds, Chaman and Abby have been working closely together to, to trans translate to lithium fluoride as a uh, pressure medium. It's not nearly as uh, quasi-hydrostatic as, as uh, neon or argon, but it has the advantage we, we can melt lithium fluoride and we can encapsulate the diamond materials within the culet itself. And then we can take the, the gasket to another facility, whether that's a, a, a atomic force microscope or a low temperature optical cryostat to do spectroscopy and, and uh, physical property measurements of these diamond materials that we've made. So Chalman ha has recently shared some really exciting uh, recent data. He's been able to recover nano diamonds made under extreme conditions, GPA pressures using a laser heated diamond anvil cell. And we're plotting the, the photoluminescence spectrum of the negatively charged nitrogen vacancy center and also the neutral nitrogen vacancy center, neutral charge nitrogen vacancy center as a function of temperature. So the, the, the black trace is a, is a spectrum at 160 Kelvin. The red trace is a spectrum at 100 Kelvin. And you can see very nice narrowing of the, the NV centers, but both the negatively charged and neutral NV centers as a function of uh, uh, temperature. And we're hoping, we're really excited at UW, there's a new dilution refrigerator where we can go down not to 100 uh, Kelvin, we can go down to 100 millikelvin. And, and we want to probe the optical transitions of these NV centers and nanodiamonds at these extremely low uh, temperatures. But beyond laser heating, I, in, in the talk so far, I've talked predominantly about laser heating. I want to finish and, and translate now, instead of talking about laser heating, I want to talk about how can we laser cool materials at extreme conditions. 
This is some really uh, intriguing work that started uh, back in the in the 90s by Richard Epstein at the Los Alamos National Lab. And Richard's group published a seminal paper in Nature in 1995, I think it was, showing laser cooling of ytterbium three plus ions in a glass, a fluoride based glass ceramic material. And over time, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing a chat here. Uh, oh, sorry, so, someone just saying uh, that they had to leave. <laughs> I want to make sure I didn't miss a question. But um, uh, over the last uh, several decades, Richard and, and his uh, colleague Mansour Sheikh Baha'i at the University of New Mexico have published some very beautiful work translating from glass-based ceramic materials to crystalline fluoride ceramic materials. And there's a really nice uh, review article that uh, uh, Mansour uh, and Richard, and also their, their uh, group member and former student, now, now professor at, at, in Montreal, Dennis Seletsky wrote back in 2010, on fascinating results using laser cooling to refrigerate lanthanide ions, this is your ytterbium three plus ions in a, in a ceramic yttrium lithium fluoride, a, a laser gain medium. Some of you may have a, a YILF laser in, in the lab right now, but effectively just shining a laser, a continuous wave uh, laser on this laser gain ceramic, and you can pump uh, electrons in the ytterbium three plus ions, effectively you absorb one photon from the pump laser. You create a long lived excited state that can radiate a photon, a new photon that's blue shifted relative to the pump photon that it absorbed. So you can think of this sort of like uh, like running a laser in reverse. You know, normally, if you run a laser, you'll, you'll pump from a ground state to an excited state. You'll dump pho phonons into the crystal that heats up the crystal. And then you have lasing that uh, 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 is useful for any number of uh, laser heated diamond anvil cell applications, for instance. But in this process, it's the exact opposite. You start with the laser coming in, you create the excited state, and then the, the excited state absorbs phonons from the crystal lattice, and then spontaneous luminescence is emitted. And you can cool a bulk single crystal in vacuum, starting from room temperature, down to 90 degrees Kelvin just using a CW laser beam. It's really remarkable. And this is just a few degrees above the, above the temperature where oxygen will condense to form liquid oxygen at atmospheric pressure. So it, it's really a remarkable technology that you can focus a laser on these crystals and, and they refrigerate instead of heat up. So my group, I, I, I learned about this as a grad student at Berkeley and I, I, I continued working in this field uh, as a postdoc at Livermore. But once we got to the University of Washington, once I got to the University of Washington, I really wanted to, to sort of push the limits instead of working in in vacuum, I wanted to start looking at uh, experiments where you could potentially add these materials into, say, uh, composites, polymers, uh, like or, or water, or even uh, within a diamond anvil cell. So, so just to really quickly give a, a more precise physical picture of what's going on here, we start with a ytterbium three plus ion. Uh, spin orbit coupling splits the F levels of the ion into a doublet F seven halves. Uh, uh, multiplet under a, a doublet F5 halves multi, multiplet. So you have a variety of different uh, uh, electronic configurations and, and energies depending on the uh, occupation of this uh, ion. Ytterbium 3 plus shares a xenon core with, with 13 additional uh, F electrons. So if you have seven total F electrons in, in the lanthanide and you're just missing one of them, that means one of the orbitals is just half filled. And interestingly, in terms of the, the sort of material science or crystallography of this uh, uh, experiment, the, the ytterbium three plus ion can occupy a range of different symmetry point groups. So in some crystalline host materials, there's very high symmetry, you know, octahedral, tetrahedral, uh, cubic-like uh, point groups. But in, in most other materials, the point group symmetry is not nearly as high. And in yield, for instance, the, the trivalent cation has an S sub four point group, which splits the lanthanide levels into a, a quartz, quartet on, under on, under a, 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 a three-level doublet F5 halves uh, upper multiplet. In, in the higher symmetry cases, these two uh, F orbitals ab above are, are, are degenerate, and, and also these two F orbitals uh, below are, are degenerate. So by tuning the crystal and host, you can also tune the crystal field splitting of, of the lanthanide. And in the overall cooling process, you can imagine starting with a half-filled F, F orbital, Phonons can can excite that f orbital, you know, ab above absolute zero to we, we number these e one two th three four and then five six seven. So, so so you can excite this half filled orbital from e seven say down to e five. What happens is 
the laser pumps an electron from E4 to E5, the hole jumps uh, the, the half-filled orbital. I, I use semiconductor language to describe this process just by analogy, but this is an interconfigurational transition. You're effectively uh, having the half-filled orbital. Uh, uh, you can think of uh, jumps from E5 to e E4, and then more phonons can excite that uh, configuration further that you can imagine the half of the orbital hopping to E3, to E2, e and E1. And then spontaneous luminescence occurs. An electron will relax. Any one of these three upper uh, uh, states can relax down to the, the half-filled state below and emit a photon that has more energy than what was absorbed. And that's really the, the core of this cooling engine is, is sort of this phonon absorption and then spontaneous luminescence from the excited state. So my group does a lot of uh, synthesis, and I, I wanted to share, if, if any of you are interested in trying out some of these materials, we would love to collaborate. We, we, we can make our own materials in the lab hydrothermally. We can also share uh, recipes if you'd like to make these materials on your own. Uh, you, you can tune o over a wide range of possible materials. My group first started looking at laser cooling materials in water. So this is a, an experiment where we had a single beam laser trap. We had a single ceramic grain in a laser tweezer. And we looked at the Brownian motion of this particle. And effectively by cranking up the laser power, we could show th that the diffusion coefficient of this particle went down instead of up in water. So uh, th this was a really exciting result that we could effectively cool the particle to, to be several degrees, even tens of degrees below uh, the, the, the temperature of the surrounding aqueous uh, water bath. So this is the first example of cold Brownian motion, so-called cold Brownian motion, since Einstein first explained uh, Brownian motion at isothermal conditions uh, back in 1905. And this was a really exciting result that we weren't sure if it would work. You know, maybe the water would dissolve away the crystal. Maybe the water would absorb more photon energy than, than the crystal could cool. And the experiment showed that we could cool th this uh, uh, this crystal at atmospheric pressure in water. So naturally, uh, you're know, working in high, in high pressure as well to, to make novel point defects. We want to answer the question, could we cool these materials, not just at atmospheric pressure and water, could we cool them at gigapascal pressures in, in a variety of different uh, pressure media? So this is a, a Merrill Bassett cell that Abby Gannis has designed at, in our group. And I, I wanted to give a shout out to Abby for designing this uh, this uh, diamond anvil cell and also Chaman Gupta for making this very nice uh, video of, of from using solid work to sort of show the experiment. We, we basically have our, our standard Merrill Bassett uh, diamond anvil cell, nothing fancy. We, we have uh, two, two anvils that we then load the uh, 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 fluoride ceramic between the, the anvils. This is a lithium fluoride pressure medium. We've also done experiments more recently in I-7, just uh, squeezing water and freezing water. You can see the optical micrograph of the diamonds, or I'm sorry, the, the, the yttrium lithium fluoride crystals here, the sort of uh, pressure medium here. This is lithium fluoride in this experiment. We also have ruby uh, crystals adjacent to, to do uh, pressure sensing. There's a really interesting structural phase transition of these uh, materials. We start with a shelite phase, which has tetragonal symmetry and S sub four point group symmetry. And under high pressure conditions, we can, we can change the phase of this uh, uh, yttrium lithium fluoride host and also the point group symmetry. And, and as a function of uh, cr crystal field uh, uh, conditions, the pressure will shift the intercrystal field energies as a function of, of pressure just based off of the local microenvironment changing around the uh, lanthanide ion. So at, at certain pressures, uh, we could see pronounced changes in the crystal field luminescence. There, there, there are three times four, 12 total possible transitions of, of ytterbium three plus in the, the shelite phase with, with a low point group symmetry. The, 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 there's this similar number in, in the Fergusonite phase, but just different crystal field levels. And we wanted to answer the question, could we cool this material before and after the phase transition? So we could, we could monitor and fit the uh, crystal field levels, just, just fitting this 12 line spectrum with Lorentzians. And we could start to see pronounced discontinuities in, in the pressure dependence of each of these uh, modes at about six and a half GPA. So th there's some, there's a variety of very nice uh, literature that ha has studied YILF before and, and phase transitions have been predicted at a range of temperatures. It's very complex because there are different grain sizes, different growth uh, uh, mechanisms uh, used to make these materials and also point defect doping levels that, that might impact the overall 
overall uh, phase transition temperature. But these are the data which I'm, I'm excited to share uh, in, in a seminar for the first time. We've actually posted this manuscript to the archive too. I apologize, I forgot to include that link in this talk, but these are the data just showing the uh, uh, lanthanide emission. We effectively, we, we, we look at the crystal field uh, emission and we integrate the, the blue spectral regions and we take a ratio with the red spectral regions and we can fit that to a Boltzmann distribution. We can also calibrate that with a thermoelectrically cooled DAC. And we can, we can calibrate that temperature as a function of, of uh, crystal field splitting and, and also the Boltzmann uh, uh, ratio uh, method. And we, we can then measure the temperature of the yttrium uh, lithium fluoride grains as a function of laser excitation power. And we can see as we increase the laser power, this ratio of, of the blue to red ratio starts to go down. And in terms of a Boltzmann fit, that, that's effectively telling us that there are fewer blue photons emitted than red photons. And, and, and that effectively correlates with, with a, a cooling trend in the temperature. We see a saturation effect where at a certain laser power, we, we stop cooling and we start heating again. But uh, interestingly, we can also uh, do experiments not just on a single particle level, we, we, can, we can do experiments with a fully loaded diamond anvil cell and also go above the phase transition uh, pressure. We can go up to a 7.9 GPA. And uh, I apologize, I, I didn't mention this before that we've got the, the ratio plotted on the left and the temperature plotted on the right. But um, if you go to above the phase transition temperature, it, it's not uh, as much cooling, but we can see statistically relevant uh, uh, drops in temperature. We have enough signal to noise to claim cooling on the order of four or five degrees below the starting temperature after the phase transition. So we were excited to see this result and that's it's the first time, not, not just you know laser cooling in vacuum or, or laser cooling in water, but this is the first experimental report of cooling materials at GPA pressures. And I'm sure many of you have seen these extremely exciting recent results on room temperature superconductors uh, published by uh, 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 Ranga Das's lab at Rochester, the Aramitz lab uh, in Germany, and also uh, the Hemley group at UIC, where, where there have been a number of exciting recent papers showing superconducting phase transitions near room temperature. And we're, we're very uh, uh, curious and, and very uh, uh, interested in trying to pursue future experiments where maybe instead of using a thermostat to make cold spots within a diamond or in, cool the entire diamond anvil cell, maybe we could use laser cooling to locally cool these, these very exciting uh, uh, light warm superconductors and potentially locally induce a superconducting phase transition with, with <clears throat> micron scale precision within a uh, uh, laser cooled diamond anvil cell. So with that, I, I think I've, I've, I've uh, talked for about uh, 50 minutes or so, and, and I, I would love to take questions uh, from the audience as well. I, I wanted to uh, really quickly plug at, at, you know, at the University of Washington, we have a very exciting new materials uh, 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 research science and engineering center, MEMSI for molecular engineered materials. And we have a user facility for high pressure experiments. So if you would like to try any, any of these types of measurements with optical spectroscopy, uh, you know, laser cooling, we have a Boulder Allmax diamond anvil cell, a pneumatic pressure controller, a, uh, a, 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 an electrostatic drilling machine to, to, to load samples. And uh, we're also trying to integrate time correlated single photon counting and possibly uh, Hanbury, Brown and Twist twist interferometry in along with the uh, uh, diamond anvil cell. So if you're interested in, in the, uh, using these facilities, please don't hesitate to reach out and I, I'd love to uh, uh, help you learn how to access the facilities. I, I, uh, I'll finish with a quick just recap, you know, talking about laser induced uh, point defect synthesis and also uh, laser cooling. I, I wanted to give one final shout out to all of my group members who have made major uh, invaluable contributions to the, the design and implementation of these experiments. It's really been a, a great team. Uh, I, I hope to see everybody, uh, if, if possible, in Seattle in 2024. And if, if you know of anybody who's interested in a postdoc or, a, a, or a pursuing a PhD in material science at the University of Washington, I also uh, uh, love, love to talk more in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for the organizers. And I'd love to take questions. Thank you very much, Peter, for a fascinating talk and sharing your uh, cutting edge uh, research with us and also for your invitation to come and collaborate at your center. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, please either unmute yourself or you can type your question in the chat box um, and I can read it for you or you can um, uh, ask your 
ask a question yourself. Any questions for Peter? I mean, <laughs> I'd like to start, I guess, with a with a a, a general chemistry question. Um, so you mentioned in your aerogel synthesis, you you mentioned the consequences of your uh, base catalyzed reaction in the glass container. Um, but early in the talk, you talked about the uh, that you could either use acid or base catalysis. What's the what drives your decision whether you're going to use acid or base catalysts? But that's a great question. And ultimately, um, one one potential aspect is the uh, heteroatoms that the uh, dopant might add to the process. So, for instance, in, in the base catalyzed process, we were using ammonium hydroxide. And the ammonium, what we think could potentially be also doping the carbon aerogel at some level to add uh, nitrogen heteroatoms to, to the recovered uh, diamond material. So uh, we've switched to the acid catalyzed process in part because we can use acetonitrile and uh, and uh, but but HCl as the catalyst to, to potentially you know the the, the chlorine uh, the HCl acid catalyst would not add as much nitrogen potentially as the ammonium uh, cation in, in the base catalyzed uh, 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 process. But, but also, you know, acetonitrile has tons of nitrogen. So, so you have to not, not just worry about the uh, catalyst, but also the solvent. And so an HCl based catalyst uh, would reduce the nitrogen doping level. And uh, an another factor that drives our decision on which catalyst to use is the time scale of the reaction. So I didn't mention this in, in the talk, but the base catalyzed reaction can last for as long as a week, which gives plenty of time for etching, you know, the glassware and, and uh, you know, the beaker. Whereas the more recently acid catalyzed reactions have been developed by uh, uh, groups at the University of Missouri. And, and also, uh, uh, I, I apologize, I'm blanking on the name of, of the PI at the group, but we, we've also, uh, followed their work to develop acid catalyzed reactions that can finish in minutes, you know, th th that you don't have to wait for material as much. So it really depends on how, you know, what, what surface areas you wanna reach, what, what uh, micro porosity levels you'd like to have and what point effects you care about. You know, we're also really interested in potentially using other uh, uh, catalysts with other heteroatoms that, you know, the, the catalyst itself could be used as a dopant for, for nano diamond synthesis. Well, it's true. Your your microstructure of the aerogel opens up a huge field of of composition space for you to explore with that. So it's something that um, people who work with diamond cells normally hadn't even thought about. You get your pressure medium <laughs> um, in, incorporated into your solid and. What a fascinating way of, uh, of, of exploring composition space. Any other questions for Peter? Could I follow up also on that with, um, you mentioned the Jan Teller distortion of the, of the uh, point defect. What's the nature yeah. of that distortion? Is that a first order or second order effect in there? Yes, yeah, it's, it, it's a it's first order, and and effectively, um, the, the the silicon atom in this in the split vacancy is it, it, you could have uh, C three uh, symmetry that that is sort of the uh, uh, um, simplest possible uh, uh, energy to calculate, or w w uh, 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 an energy that you can calculate with no uh, atomic reconfigurations, but by having a slight rotation of the the carbon atoms surrounding the the, the split vacancy, you can lower the energy uh, by several millivolts further, and and effectively uh, you can split the 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 degeneracy of the the uh, homo and lumo levels. In 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 fact, in effect, uh, going from having just one possible homo lumo uh, transition energy, but after the Jan Teller distortion, by lowering the the energy, you can have a doublet in the ground state and a, 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 a non degenerate level in the excited state, and that effectively uh, changes the luminescence spectrum 
of the negative negatively charged silicon uh, split vacancy, where instead of having just a single line in the in the uh, zero phonon line uh, at low temperature, you can see a quartet. You you can see you know uh, a, a, a re relaxation from you know the two possible excited state uh, levels to the two possible ground state levels, and so uh, that. That's the primary experimental evidence for the Jan Teller distortion. You have uh, some non-trivial spin, spin orbit coupling that leads to uh, spin orbit splitting of, of uh, the, the uh, uh, frontier orbitals of the silicon atom. And then you effectively have Jan Teller uh, uh, splitting that, that converts the Homo Lumo transition from a single energy to four possible uh, total energies. But, but it's effectively a energy minimization uh, 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 effect very similar to what occurs in organometallic uh, compounds. You, you just lower the total energy of the point defect, and uh, I, I'd never really seen, uh, you know, when I first started looking into the literature, a Jan Teller distortion in a solid crystal. I, I'd only really seen them in in uh, you know or, organometallic compounds, but right. there's yeah. some there's some good experimental evidence that you know it's it's occurring if you can go to low temperatures. That's uh, it's an interesting area where the the, the silicon split vacancy has a really broad luminescence band, and, and it's because at, at, at room temperature, or high temperatures and standard pressures, there are actually three different isotopes of silicon, silicon 28, 29, and 30. And so the, the spin orbit offset is slightly different for each of those three isotopes. And then each of the three isotopes has its own quartet of, of possible transition energies. So it's a very broad uh, transition. Yeah. Any further questions? <laughs> well, I do have one more. Um, yeah. You mentioned early the diamonds, the, the, the nano diamonds in the cell. How does the cell adjust to the presence of that in there? Yeah, the 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 cell. Um, you know, we're we're definitely changing locally the density of the. Uh, amorphous carbon phase, you know, you're going from a much lower density to the, the, the highest possible density, you know, at those conditions when you make diamond. And I think that there's undoubtedly some strain that that forms locally around the diamonds. And we're trying to get a sense of whether the, the strain that's induced post synthesis could potentially explain in part the, the width of the zero phonon line of the negatively charged NV center, you know, the, the, the local, um, uh, uh, it, whether it's lithium fluoride or argon uh, that, that's melting and then recrystallizing, once you have that volume change of, of amorphous carbon, you could potentially uh, induce strains in, in the nanodiamond materials that lead to sort of broadening in the photoluminescence spectrum. But we have a lot of questions too about the, the precise atomic location of the say nitrogen versus silicon heteroatoms in the the diamond grains you know if they're if they're closest to the closer to the surface they may experience more strain than if they're in the center of the the diamond and so we're trying to ideally our, our long-term goal is to be able to have a single silicon atom in the center of this organic you know hydrocarbon starting material as far away from the surface as possible and we hypothesize that that will reduce the full width at half max and broadening of, you know, strain induced broadening of the uh, point effects. Okay. Um, one more thing. Um, so uh, for people who are interested in uh, collaborating with your center, contact you directly. Yes. Yes. Uh, th th they can uh, 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 please reach out to me directly. And also I I'll type in the chat box here. Um, and also, I can add this to my uh, my slide uh, slide deck. Let me just uh, stop sharing for a second, or, or uh, stop um, display mode. I'll I'll type here under the NSF funding. There's a great website. I should have added added this murfn.org. M R F N M R F N.org. And this is a website you can go to. And and this is this Murfin stands for Materials Research Facilities Network. Right. And uh, M Materials Research F F Facilities Network, and the high pressure facilities that we're trying to that, that we're launching off the ground from scratch at UW 
are the first high pressure facilities within the MRFIN network that we're aware of. And so I, I would I would love to talk with all of you. You know, uh, you, we can stop recording. You know, uh, and, and then maybe maybe there'll be some more questions after we stop recording too. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about what facilities could be valuable to complement the world class high pressure user facilities already at the APS. You know, th th this is something where as a community it would be really valuable to get input and feedback on uh, what what the community would like to see in terms of uh, you know, uh, optical spectroscopy and, and characterization at extreme conditions. Okay. But we don't have a synchrotron, we don't have a synchrotron at UW. So it's, uh, we, we can't do a uh, uh, synchrotron based work yeah. for now. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, from the audience, then please uh, join me in thanking uh, Professor Pawlowski for a wonderful talk and uh, sharing his really, really uh, front uh, forefront research with us today. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. And thanks again for uh, all your efforts to organize these seminars. It's really great to be able to hear about science. And I, I like talking with my kids about, you know, the, the books they're reading at school but it's also fun to learn about high pressure. <laughs> well, that's right. I think it's, I think it's provided a, a nice forum and, and we're, you know, we're, we're continuing to uh, host the seminars. We'll take a break in August and then we'll be right back at it in September. So we'll, we'll hope yeah. that you'll join us again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to hang out too after the, after the recording, if, if anybody wants to talk about uh, the science or postdocs or, the, the uh, MERSAC Center facilities in, in any of the above. Okay.